Hi, and welcome to this talk on From the Matrix to the Metaverse. I'm David Chalmers, and I'm looking forward to exploring with you some philosophical issues about virtual worlds, including the Matrix and the Metaverse, two famous examples from science fiction and quite a few others besides. So the themes I'll be talking about today, um, I explore at some length in a book I just published a couple of weeks ago now called Reality Plus, Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy. Uh, there's the US edition with the butterfly and the, uh, the UK edition with clouds. If you look closely, you can spot some hints of pixelation, maybe a hints of virtuality in, uh, in reality. Today, I'm just going to you know, go fairly quickly, a quick romp through a few key themes um, of the book. If you're interested, uh, you can explore them at much greater length um, in, this, uh, in this book. The basic idea here is a philosophical inquiry into virtual worlds and virtual reality. Because I think they really raise huge numbers of philosophical questions, and they actually shed light on many traditional issues in philosophy as well. For my purposes, I like to you know, define terms when I can. So one key term is a virtual world. By a virtual world, I mean an interactive computer-generated world. So here's an example, uh, the world of, of uh, World of Warcraft, a massive multiplayer online video game where many people go and hang out in this computer-generated space, which they can interact with. They can interact with other people. They can interact with the world. That's a video game virtual world, but virtual worlds don't need to be video games. Here's the world of Second Life, which you know, peaked around 2007, but still going, still fairly big today. People use this for all kinds of social purposes, work, play, employment, community building, relationships. Um, it's a really, so it's a canonical virtual world. But these two virtual worlds are not yet virtual reality. Virtual reality requires a third condition. Virtual reality is an immersive, interactive, computer-generated world. Here, the key extra condition to be virtual reality is immersiveness. Virtual reality, or VR, you experience from the inside Three-dimensionally, you're immersed in a world that's all around you. Um, so World of Warcraft and Second Life are not standardly experienced this way, but um, there are many worlds now one can experience through, say, a virtual reality headset. Here's the Oculus Quest 2. I have my own Oculus Quest 2. You just put it on, and suddenly, wow, there's a, a, a three-dimensional world all around you that you can experience and interact with. Play games, here's, um, here's a, the game Beat Saber. Beat Saber, where you could kind of slash some cubes with your lightsabers in time for the music. There are also social virtual worlds that you can experience through VR as well. But for full-scale virtual worlds, my two paradigms are the matrix and the metaverse, both from science fiction. The matrix is a paradigm of the idea the whole universe might be a simulation, that we could end up to be in a simulation ourselves. The metaverse is a paradigm of the idea of virtual world technology that we develop and then use and then enter um, a virtual world. It comes from Neil Stevenson's novel, Snow Crash, where uh, the metaverse was a place where people increasingly spent time. So this stands for coming virtual reality technology. And I think all this requires philosophical analysis, both for philosophical purposes and for practical purposes. Now, I have a key unifying thesis, which is virtual reality is genuine reality. And that has a number of sub-theses. I mean, people very frequently say that virtual reality is some kind of fake or fictional reality, it's a second class reality, it's an illusion. That's the thesis I want to reject. I want to say virtual reality is different from physical reality, but in many respects on a par with it. And this breaks down into at least three sub-theses. First, 
It's possible that physical reality is already virtual reality. That is, it's possible that we are in virtual reality already. I don't say that we are in such a virtual reality. I don't even say necessarily that it's more likely than not, but I think it, we might be, and it's not something we can rule out. Second, I think virtual reality is not an illusion or a fiction. The objects we interact with in VR are real objects. There are digital objects to be sure, but they're no less real for all that. Needn't be an illusion or a fiction. Third, we can lead a meaningful life in virtual reality. Um, it needn't be escapism. It needn't be meaningless. In principle, many of the sources of meaning of life in a physical reality can also be present in virtual reality. So I'll try and defend those three theses fairly quickly in what follows. And I'll do this with reference to these two, you know, these two big tentpoles, tentpole ideas of virtual worlds. I'll start with the matrix, which illustrates the idea that we could be living in a computer simulation. And then I'll switch to the metaverse, which illustrates the role of coming virtual reality technology that we'll, that we'll use and increasingly spend our, spend our time in. I think some of the morals you get from the matrix will then generalize to apply to the metaverse, hence from the matrix to the metaverse. But I'll start with the matrix and with the idea that we are in a computer simulation, sometimes called the simulation hypothesis. The simulation hypothesis says we are in a lifelong computer simulation. So like Neo at the beginning of the matrix is in a lifelong computer simulation. Um, by the time we get to uh, Matrix Resurrections, we've discovered, okay, there's a simulation, there's a world out there, there's a, there's a new video game based on it, there are modals, there are potentially simulations within simulations. There's still many characters in the, uh, in the Matrix at various points turn out to be in this giant lifelong computer simulation, namely the Matrix. They're inside, they're inhabiting a simulated world. This is great for a philosopher because it's highly reminiscent of a famous challenge issued by Rene Descartes back in the 1640s in his Meditations on First Philosophy, sometimes viewed as a founding work of modern philosophy. Descartes was interested in the question, how, what can we know and how can we know it? He asked the question, how do you know anything about external reality? How do you know you're not dreaming right now? How do you know um, that your senses aren't fooling you? Or most famously, how do you know an evil demon isn't deceiving you by producing sensations as of an external world when none of this is real? These days, we ask that, we ask that question by raising questions like, how do you know you're not in a simulation? Here, okay, here I've got a, a wonderful illustration of the evil demon doing its work uh, by actually programming a simulation. It's like, this is a high-tech evil demon feed signals to a brain floating in a vat. The brain experiences the world uh, out there, but sassed it out. Is any of that real? And the brain reassures itself with, okay, I know that I, at the very least, least, I know that I am here thinking, therefore I exist. I think, therefore I am. So the brain is certain of its own existence, but it, it has doubts about the external world. Maybe I'm in, uh, maybe the evil demon is fooling me. By the way, all these illustrations are um, by a wonderful illustrator, illustrator Tim Peacock, who did 57 illustrations uh, for this book, Reality Plus, and just did an amazing job of bringing these philosophical and science fiction scenarios to life. So these days we pose Descartes' question by asking, how do you know you're not in a simulation? And it's very hard to see how you could ever know for sure that you're not. You might think you could have some conclusive evidence that you're not in a simulation. I don't know, maybe the behavior of your cat or your best friend or something in nature somehow proves we're not in a simulation. But it sure looks like in principle, any evidence could be simulated. There could be simulations of your cat or of your best friend or of, a, or of nature, which would in principle be indistinguishable from physical reality. It may well be that in a few years, we'll actually develop simulations like that. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below.
Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.